Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, April 16th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, Obama garners praise for his role in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the BLM is up to their old tricks, this time in Oregon. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, that manly culture, John Wayne and 707 horsepower cars, is coming back and it threatens the New World Order and its culture that we've got, 1776. Well, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is coming before the Senate in just a matter of days. Things are building to a head. And of course, we've been talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership as well as the Transatlantic Partnership for a long time here at InfoWars, talking about how this is the next step in global governance. But as Time Magazine points out, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they say, will help to define Obama's legacy as a president. It is also going to define who these senators are that want to be president, especially the ones in the Republican Party. Senators like Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and others will have to watch them very closely to see what they do with this fast-track treaty that is now coming before the Senate. Of course, we've seen details that have leaked out about the sovereignty-destroying aspects of this. Going back to NAFTA, you don't need to have a thousand-page agreement if you want free trade. There's something else there when it's that large. And of course, this is an agreement that has been negotiated in secret by corporate lobbyists for many, many years. And our elected representatives have not been allowed to see it, or if they see it, they're not allowed to talk about it. And it's going to come before the Senate. They're going to have to, as part of the fast track process, vote on it very quickly. They will not be allowed to offer any amendments. It'll be an up or down, take it or leave it, all at once. This, again, is going to be coming up in the next few days. Let's take a look, though at NAFTA's legacy, because when Obama presented this to people, he said, of course, mistakes were made with NAFTA. We're not going to do that again. And yet he has many people in his close cabinet of economic advisors who wrote NAFTA. Let's look at what NAFTA has done for us. And of course, this is a bipartisan effort. It was Bill Clinton that claimed that NAFTA would create an export boom to Mexico. He said it would create 200,000 jobs in just two years. And remember both Clinton and Bush number one, Bush number one, were both in favor of NAFTA at the time. But what have we really seen? Not 200,000 new jobs in two years, but we have seen 682,000 jobs gone, 61% of those in manufacturing. And of course, other organizations like the Chamber of Commerce that want to promote this are telling us, well, look, we've had jobs created. They're not looking at the net number of jobs. They're just looking at jobs that were created by exports, not jobs that have been lost due to imports. Let's take a look at the deficit side of this. That's the other part of the economic news. Look at this chart from the same article. You can see that immediately after passage, we have the largest trade deficit the U.S. had ever seen, right after it, and it never got smaller. That trade deficit, that massive trade deficit, continued for a number of years, and then it grew. And for the last 14 years, we have had 14 record trade deficits. So it's not just a loss of income, which comes with a loss of jobs. But as we go into debt, there is a loss of wealth. And we can see that in terms of multinational corporations and foreign governments coming in and basically asking for our resources from our senators who then turn it over to them. That's what we saw happening with the BLM, trying to do that in uh, Nevada. We see that going on. Uh, John McCain has been successful in doing that in Arizona. We're going to be talking to someone at the end of the program where we see the end game being played with the miners in Oregon. But it's not just America. And of course, it's not really a failure. And it's not just about economics either. It would be a mistake to see this simply as an economic failure, as bad economic policy. No, it's doing precisely what it was designed to do. And the other part of this that mainstream media is not talking about is the loss of sovereignty. The fact that this is something that has been part of the long-term plan to create global governance by multinational corporations. You can see it very clearly now. We now see that as they've created these regional consolidations like NAFTA, like the EU, now they are consolidating those regions into a global governance. That's what the Trilateral Commission was all about. And again, that was Carter's uh, chief of staff, the big new Brzezinski, who created the Trilateral Commission. It was going to be North America, Europe, Asia. And that's where we see these trade agreements and now the consolidation. And so they're coming out of the closet telling us, oh yeah, 
NAFTA was about sovereignty all along, but don't worry, this is about simply trade. It's not simply about trade. We can see that's happening. We need to stand up in mass and take it down. And as I point out, it's not just here in America. The same thing is happening in Europe. People who are trying to renegotiate the treaty, the European Union treaty, especially those in the UK, are now seeing that even at this stage, the EU is saying they're not going to listen to the treaty, they're not going to abide by the process, the rules that have been set in place. We see the story from RT saying that Juncker doesn't have authority to delay the EU treaty changes, say Tories. Now, this is the guy who is the president of the European Union Commission. They say a growing number of bureaucrats oppose Prime Minister David Cameron of the UK. They oppose his demand for EU treaty renegotiation. They're fearful of a quiet democratic revolution that is coming out of the EU citizens' will to protect the sovereignty of their national parliaments. And so what they're going to do is they are going to delay this until they have time to consolidate this more. And as I pointed out, one of the uh, Conservative Party members said, treaty change is entirely a matter for the member states using the commission as secretariat. They're saying he's asserting powers that he doesn't have. Isn't that interesting? We see that all the time, don't we? And yet, it was just a couple of weeks ago that we saw people like the head of PIMCO, the world's largest bond company, saying we were going to have to have a United States of Europe for this to work. That these defaults that were coming from Greece and others were going to break apart the European Union unless they asserted sovereignty. So you can see there again, it's not simply a trade agreement. It is not a free trade zone. This was always about creating a United States of Europe. Now the head of the bond company, the world's largest bond company, PIMCO, is saying it. We've also had Alan Greenspan saying exactly the same thing. So they're telling us where this is headed. This is clearly a case of international sovereignty being lost to these corporations. So we all need to stand up, pay very close attention to this, and pay attention to what the senators do, how they vote on this. That will tell you who really owns them or if they're their own man. Now, in other news, we see that we're also learning that uh, from the mainstream media, finally admitting what we've been telling you for five years, that the TSA has been condoning systemically sexual molestation, sexual crimes against adults and against children. Now they're coming out and saying it. We have this story from Time Magazine saying, former TSA agent says, the groping scandal is business as usual. And of course, there's a recent story that we've covered here at InfoWars about two TSA screeners at the Denver International Airport manipulating the full body scanners so they could grope men's crotches. They say, however, over the course of six years of the TSA, the leveraging of rules and surveillance tools to abuse passengers was a daily checkpoint occurrence. And the writer of this article is disturbed because there's so many jokes in the comments section. He says, this is not a joke. He says, it's easy to forget that the groping or so of these dozen or so male passengers by two conspiring TSA screeners is sexual assault, plain and simple. And they also point out that this is something that was an investigation that was shut down by the TSA. There are no criminal charges being brought against these screeners. They're not going to jail. They simply lost their jobs. And the TSA is still protecting their identity. As TechDirt reports, the TSA's investigation to groping agents ensured that they would not be prosecuted. They say many people find it odd that two TSA agents who were still unnamed merely lost their jobs rather than getting arrested for the activity. And an investigator, Chris Bray at TSA News, found out as she looked at Denver police reports that the TSA set up its investigation in a manner that would guarantee that no criminal charges or the names of the TSA agents would ever be revealed. She said the TSA was first told about this scheme back in November 18th of 2014, and for nearly two months, they allowed these sexual perverts to continue operating, to continue what they were doing, did not notify the police. If they had told the police, the police could have uh, observed what was going on. They could have arrested these individuals. Instead, what they did was they didn't tell the Denver police until after these individuals had been fired and were long gone and said, well, we're not going to tell you who they are. That's kind of like, as I point out in the article, kind of like reporting a fire long after the building has burned down and there's nothing but a bunch of cold ashes there. And I just want to point out to you that we have been mocked and criticized by the mainstream media for over five years 
for pointing out that this is systemic perversion in the TSA. Take a look at this report from uh, April 26, for example, 2012. The TSA is still groping children at airports, reported. And they said the agents are coldly referring to kids as suspects. Steve Watson pointed out in this article, a four-year-old girl was called a suspect in order to undergo a full pat-down by TSA officers after hugging her grandmother during the screening process. And then, of course, Paul Joseph Watson pointed out, also in 2012, FOIA letters, Freedom of Information Act request letters, reveal shocking cases of TSA groping genitals. See, we said they're groping genitals. Everybody said, oh, you're exaggerating. You're overstating the case. It's hyperbole. It's not that bad. We have a legal system. We don't have a legal system that protects us anymore. We have a criminal agency that is covering up and creating this kind of atmosphere where the public gets sexually molested. It's a power play, as Alex has pointed out many times. Listen to this article from 2012. Hundreds of letters of complaint about the TSA's invasive security procedures released this week, that was three years ago, under the FOIA request, include numerous horror stories about TSA screeners directly touching people's genitals during pat-downs. The letters confirmed what we first reported back in 2010, five years ago now, that the TSA's new security procedures for advanced pat-downs include literally touching, and in some cases, groping the genitals of travelers. And as a final comment, I would say, take a look at this article from 2014, last year. We pointed out that there was a case of a pervert in an airport who was going around, he dressed up as a TSA screener, and he was going around and feeling people, yet the victims didn't realize that this guy was an imposter, even though he was drunk. Do we realize that the real imposter that we see before us is the TSA, is Homeland Security? They are drunk with power, and they are molesting the American public, and the American public can't even see it. Stay with us right after the break. We're going to talk about the real roots of our problems in, in surveillance, and it's not just the war of terror. It goes back to the war on drugs. That's where it all began, and we're going to see some amazing statements by some Republican wannabe presidents. Stay with us. We'll be right back. My name is Alex Jones. Most of you know me from my syndicated radio program and my documentary films, as well as InfoWars Nightly News. When I got on air 20 years ago, I had discovered the globalist program, their plan to take over the world, and my focus went from running six miles every other day, swimming two, three miles a couple times a week, and lifting weights to focusing on fighting the globalist. I've gone from 279 pounds all the way down to 235 pounds and the weight's going off even faster. Super Male Vitality, Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine, and Oxy Powder. Those three products of the entire family of InfoWarsLife.com products are the most important from my own personal experience. And it wasn't just that my weight loss accelerated, my muscle mass increased, my stamina, my energy levels exploded. Now is the time to take action. Start your journey today with the Alex Challenge Pack. It's the trifecta of change. Secure yours today and get free shipping for a limited time at InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. The vaccination lies and hysteria continue to ramp up in California. The Temecula Valley School District recently sent a letter home to parents stating the following. To help protect your children and others from whooping cough, a new California law now requires students to be vaccinated against whooping cough. This applies to all students entering the seventh grade and any student transferring from out of state. 
but they fail to mention the exemption that exists by law that covers medical or personal beliefs. In fact, you can find it in the California Health and Safety Code 120325, and the particulars of the exemption can be found in California Health and Safety Code 120360, which is specifically about the exemptions. It's letters like these that continue to push Big Pharma's agenda to inject you and your young children with toxins, heavy metals, live viruses, and DNA from insects. Don't be intimidated by vaccine pushers. Do your own research and read the damn insert. This is Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. For more reports like these, subscribe to the Alex Jones channel on YouTube. Welcome back. Now, it's not just the TSA that is coming up for consideration in just a few days. The Guardian reports that uh, Section 215 of the Patriot Act is coming up for reconsideration in 45 days. Now, of course, 215 was the uh, part of the Patriot Act that the NSA said, that gives us the right to collect bulk data on people. But if you remember, Michael Hayden bragged about the fact that he didn't need 215. He had a direct order from the president. So that trumps the Constitution, that trumps the laws, that allows them to do anything they want. Right. This is something that has been going on a long time. It's one of the reasons why I support taking down drug prohibition. The war on drugs is where this has all originated, and people haven't seen this for a long time. Thankfully now, some people are starting to see this as Michael Hayden made his case that he had this order, this super secret order that nobody but he and the president uh, knew about that allowed him to do whatever he wished. Others who respected the Constitution, who respected the rule of law, like William Binney and Thomas Drake, resigned as whistleblowers in protest. But this has been going on a long time in the war on drugs. Look at this article from the Washington Post. They point out the shared roots of the war on drugs and the war on terror in one single chart. Look at that chart. Scroll down and show them that chart, and you'll see that 90% of the wiretaps that are issued are for drug offenses. Now, of course, what that chart doesn't show you is that the NSA and the CIA don't go to court to get authorization for wiretaps or for surveillance. Actually, they do go to something that, is, that they call a court, the FISA court, and they get one order that they say allows them to do dragnet surveillance for all Americans. So I guess that just counts as one. But understand, as Andy Greenberg pointed out in this Washington Post article, he said the program serves as a reminder that most of the legal battles between government and surveillance efforts and the Fourth Amendment's privacy protections over the last decades have played out first on the front lines of America's war on drugs. Let's understand, this is not a war on drugs, and it's not a war on terrorism. It is a war of drugs against the American people. It is a war of terrorism against the American people. Our government is operating both sides of this. We have shown this over and over again, how our government supplies the drugs, runs the drugs, puts them into the communities as a plague, and then comes in and says, we're going to protect you from this holocaust that we've created. It's a government-run war of drug terrorism that they're running against us. But of course, Republicans want more of it. They want it harder and stronger than we're even getting it now. We have two Republicans uh, coming out and saying they vow a war on pot if they take the White House. This is Marco Rubio and Chris Christie. They say they will clamp down on cannabis sales, according to the Daily Mail. They, Rubio says, I think we need to enforce our federal laws. Well, I would agree with them. Why don't we enforce the Constitution, for starters? Why don't you get an amendment to the Constitution like you had to do for alcohol to prohibit pot? It's because you don't respect the laws of our country, Marco Rubio. He also defended his framing of Hillary Clinton, they say, as past her prime and said he was knocking her ideas and not her age. Well, let me point out that Marco Rubio's idea of drug prohibition is something that is now 44 years old. It's an abject failure for its stated purpose. But of course, it's also an agenda that was created by the UN 54 years ago, and its stated purpose is not what its real purpose is. Its real purpose is to give government and power to the uh, power to the government and to take power and rights away from the people. And then Chris Christie echoes back to Reefer Madness and he says, marijuana is a gateway drug. Listen, the war on drugs is a gateway to the loss of our rights, to the loss of due process, 
to the corruption of our court systems and law enforcement, that's the true gateway. That represents a far greater danger to us than individuals, and you can't solve the drug problem for individuals with law enforcement. But Rubio and Christie think they can. Listen to what else Rubio said. He said he believes in states' rights, but laws created by the federal government legally supersede those of the states. No, actually, there's a division of power. These people are not qualified to be president. You need to understand that, along with most of the people that are running on both sides of this issue. Let's understand really where the war of terrorism is coming from. As I said before, it is a war of drugs of our government against the people. It is also a war of terrorism by our government against the people terrorizing us. This is put out in some interesting uh, format today. We have an article that shows a graph from a site that actually lists the number of people killed by cops over the last 15 years. An article on Infowars.com research shows cops kill thousands more Americans than terrorists. Americans are constantly warned every day there is a deadly threat from terrorists, but there's far more immediate and deadly threat to Americans across the nation, one that can strike at any time, one that has killed untold thousands more than lost their lives on September 11, 2001, and every other terrorist incident combined since then. The threat is the police. Now, if you look at this map, scroll down, look at this map. If you go to the article, you can actually zoom in on that map. You can hover over each of these individual uh, incidents here. You can see how many people were uh, killed and how they were killed in different areas. But as they point out, this organization that put together this uh, data says that it only captured about 35% of total police killings since 2000 so far. So at best, this map represents a minimum of police-related killings over the past 15 years. It's very difficult to get this information. They don't report on this information about themselves. And if you look at that map, as you hover over individual dots, you will see whether or not anybody was convicted of that. And as he points out in this article, Steve Watson says, by those calculations, around 16,000 Americans are likely to have been killed by police in that time, over 1,000 every year. And remember, as we pointed out, just over the last, over the first three months of uh, this year, we've already had over 300 people killed nationally by the police, as reported by the media. Some people that have totaled that up. It is actually increasing, not decreasing. We need to have a discussion as to what the purpose of law enforcement is. Is law enforcement a standing army? How can we have law and order in this country if our police are lawless and brutalizing the citizens? Stay with us, we're gonna take a break, and right after the break, we're going to talk to someone from the Galice Mining District, the area where the BLM is threatening to take over a gold mine by force and not giving any explanation. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Another major health threat, this one in Toledo, Ohio, where everybody in the entire city has been told not to drink the water. Ohio's governor declaring a state of emergency. Did you know that the average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water at home every single day? If there's a water emergency, will you be prepared? Panicked residents forming long lines throughout the day. We're here at a supermarket in Toledo. You can see the shelves empty where water once was. To stay safe and healthy during a crisis, you must must have access to safe, clean water. Water which will not be available at your local grocery store. There's a mad dash on right now to stock up on supplies. The ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system is a must have for every modern, independently minded household. Protect your family's safety during an emergency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today to purchase your ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system or call 1-88-253-3139. InfoWars Life and InfoWarsLife.com is extremely excited to announce our latest release, Winter Sun, a revolutionary type of vitamin D3. Winter Sun is a premium quality vitamin D3 nutritional supplement. It is produced by extracting oil from healthy, nutrient-dense plants known as lichens. Every batch is analyzed for purity and D3 content. It's completely free of toxins and allergens. Simply put, if you want the best at an extremely low price, this is it. Winter Sun is the result of our 
our pursuit of the best source of vitamin D3. The research and development took over two years, but the result, as verified by independent laboratories, is the best vegan vitamin D3 product in the world. Read the facts at InfoWarsLife.com about Winter Sun Vitamin D3. Not only does vitamin D3 promote a healthy mood, but vitamin D supports our memory and brain function, something the globalists are targeting. Visit InfoWars.com today or call 888-253-3139. Are you concerned about police departments across America using Stingray devices to steal cell phone data? The Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette reports Matthew Campbell, a lawyer representing three Fort Smith police officers in a whistleblower case, said that someone tried to hack into his computer by giving him an external hard drive contaminated with malicious hardware. It was Douglas Carson, the attorney representing Fort Smith and its police department, who sent Matthew Campbell the hard drive. Upon examination, it was discovered that the hard drive contained four Trojans, one of which was a duplicate. Mr. Campbell told PC Magazine, One would have kept my internet active even if I tried to turn it off. One would have stolen any passwords that I entered in, and the other would have allowed the installation of other malicious software. Seems like the Fort Smith government is taking a page from the NSA. In 2013, Spiegel reported, The NSA's Tau hacking unit is considered to be the intelligence agency's top secret weapon. It maintains its own covert network, infiltrates computers around the world, and even intercepts shipping deliveries to plant backdoors and electronics ordered by those it's targeting. Of course, it's all for our safety. Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars.com and InfoWars Nightly News. <laughs> Earlier this week, we reported on a situation that looks like it may be coming to a head in just over a week. Some miners in southern Oregon have been given a deadline to clear out of a mine that they've had since the 1870s. There's a clear chain of title, and the miners are asking for a legal explanation from the BLM, and they're not getting it. Oath Keepers have taken up a defensive posture there, one of providing security to try to make sure that nothing is going to happen until they can hear this through the court system. We're going to talk to Kirby Jackson from the Gleese Mining District. He's going to define for us what the mining district is. You'll be surprised. It's not just an association. He's also going to give us a history of what's been going on in the area. And you're going to see yet again how in 21st century America, bureaucracies are taking upon themselves to not only write the laws, but enforce the laws and have their own court systems. We no longer have a government of by and for the people. We have a government of bureaucrats who are running this by themselves, for themselves, to create their empire. So joining us now is Kirby Jackson from the Gleese Mining District. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Jackson. I guess one of the things we need to do first is kind of lay this out for the audience, because most people are not really familiar with what's going on in mining. Let's start with the Gleese Mining District. This is not a club. It's not an association of miners. Tell us what this is. Uh, I am the recorder of what is referred to as the Gleese Mining District. Uh, way back in 1872, when Congress first established the mining law, basically what they did at the time, all the miners on the ground, they were, they were outlaws. They were regarded as squatters, and they were, had actually organized the first governments in a lot of these mining areas here. You know, we had mining camps and things like that. So the mining districts originally, they were the first governments in a lot of these areas before the counties and the states came about. So in... Uh, 1866, when Congress drafted their first mining law, it was actually really just a federal recognition of what the miners were already doing on the ground because, you know, our forerunners, they were the, the first government guys out here when we had a, an early frontier society. So Congress, when they recognized what the miners were doing, that's what they decided was the best thing to do. Uh, they recognized these mining districts, and they, more or less, it was the first time in history the any government in the world had actually recognized that the miners who were working the land should also have the right to establish the rules and regulations as far as how they obtain their property, how they maintain their property, and basically how they settled grievances among themselves. Okay, so, so you've got a lot different. of so you you've got a lot of different uh, small mines that are there, and this is essentially, as you point out on your website, it's an organization of self-government. But it's a little bit different for people because a lot of, you know, what we're looking at in the cities and the counties, a lot of people don't really understand, just like they didn't understand at the Bundy Ranch, that there are different kinds of property rights. You're not saying that you own everything there. You've got mining rights, just like he had grazing rights or water rights. We have hunters who have rights to hunt as they're on the land. So there's all these different multiple uses that can exist on public lands at the same time, right? That's 
That's that's right. And basically, what the mining law did when it, when it was first established, the the main core of it was finally refined in 1872 in what is typically called the the General Mining Act of 1872. And that's that's not its proper name. It was uh, had a very long name Congress had that they gave to it. And that's not important. But basically what they did was they, they established the first rights of miners. And what they recognized at the time was that, like other settlers, such as homesteaders and uh, woodsmen who were making their living by uh, harvesting trees or they were getting rocks, they basically recognized that these, set, these early settlers, they should have protection under the law. And mm-hmm. so basically they wanted to define those rights. So the, the early rights of the miners were they, they not only had the right to go out on the the lands out here, which were held in trust by the government for the people, and that's that's still the way it's supposed to work, and obviously this is part of the problem we have now, is that it, it's no longer the, the government doesn't want to treat it the same way. So basically at that time, Congress, they recognized that we need to establish what these guys have in the way of rights. So early on, they established that the miner had the right to go out and find these minerals. He had the right to develop his property for his benefit, which in turn would benefit the nation. And in return, he would have some protection under the law from whether it's the government or other miners or other users. And basically what they recognized was that in addition to that, early on, the miners had what they called exclusive possession and enjoyment of their property within the lines of their claim. And the way it works, you go out upon the land, that's you find an area that's unclaimed, and you go out there and you look for minerals. And if you find a valuable deposit of them that you think is – Worth do worth your time doing. You have the right to claim that, and that's done by recording it. You know, filing a location, posting a location notice on the site. So just kind of corner. exactly, just kind of recording it, just like you would if you're going to buy land to put your house on. And and here in Texas, for example, it's very common when we buy a home that those mineral rights do not transfer. They're held by that, previous that, that, people. So we all need to understand as people are looking at this that there's different levels of property rights even on the same piece of land. And we also need to understand that a government that doesn't recognize our property rights will treat us as if we were property, will treat us as if we were slaves. So to, to cap this up, this, these miners went out there in about 150 years ago, and about the time mm-hmm. of the Civil War, they're mining this, they uh, set this up as governments, Congress recognizes this officially in 1872, but then we have this thing called the BLM that's created to ostensibly manage federal lands. And let's go to 1955. In 1955, there's a Surface Resources Act. And I think this has something to do, uh, at least the BLM is claiming that it has something to do with this particular case. So explain that to us and explain how this older mine, which uh, goes back to the early 1870s, is grandfathered in and not affected by this 1955 Surface Act. Right. Yeah. So the the 1955 Surface Resources Act, this actually has everything to do with it. And we we agree with BLM that it does have everything to do with it. So in in 1955, Congress was starting to recognize that there were an awful lot of people out there. They were using, they were basically what they were doing, they were abusing the mining law. They were using the mining law to build private hunting cabins to squat on land. And needless to say, there were a lot of conflicts with other people who wanted to to, to use the public land system. So Congress decided to change the mining law. And what they decided to do was that all claims that were located by miners and filed after that time, July 23rd, 1955, they did not, they had the right to use the surface, but they did not have a surface control or control of the resources and basically full willy nilly uh, utilization of those surfaces and uh, obviously the vegetative surfaces especially is what they were referring to. You know, so needless to say, the claims that were filed after that, they changed from the original meaning within the mining law, and that is something that still continues to this day. But they had to deal with the claims that were already there, and that is where this issue comes in. So Congress, they came up with three ideas, and these ideas they came up with. These were largely suggestions of the United States Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And the three things they came up with were, is that basically they recognized that they couldn't just tell these miners, hey, we're here now. You've had this all along. We're going to start taking your rights away. They didn't, they didn't do that or they didn't intend to do that. Mm-hmm. And so basically they, they provided some mechanisms for the miners to either, <clears throat> on one hand, they could 
say, I relinquish my surface rights back to the government, and I'm going to allow the general public to come out of my claimant camp here and, you know, get uh, cut fire with things of that nature, subject to whatever the government's, whatever the agency's rules are. So that was one option. Another option was the miner could say, well, I don't really want to deal with this anymore, so I'm just going to give up my claim. That was the second option. Now, the third option, and this was, was the option that was best suited for most miners if they were serious, they could preserve their existing rights. And how this was done, it was done by filing with the BLM or the U.S. Forest Service what was called a verified statement. And the verified statement was basically the miner informing the government, hey, I am over here, and I'm going to maintain my rights. And what was done at that time, the government then had the opportunity to go in and try to challenge those rights. If they found there was a conflict with other uses, you know, such as timber harvesting or public recreation or wildlife management or something to that extent. And needless to say, there were avenues where the government could go down. They could challenge the validity of the claim and basically say, you're not really a miner. You know, you're somebody else. You're right. just a guy abusing the mining law. And needless to say, the government set up guidelines that they had to follow to either basically to take that surface away from the miners. Okay, that's good. That now let's talk, let's talk about this specific, uh, specific case, the sugar pine mine. Uh, this is the one where we have the conflict. Am I correct to say okay. that the BLM is saying that because of uh, we're, we're exercising these uh, surface rights regulations, and yet you're saying that the sugar pine mine has already registered in a grandfather clause uh, position, right? Is that correct? That's that, that's that's correct. So the the sugar pine is actually it was the the first hard rock gold mine discovered in the state of Oregon, and that was back in 1858. Mm. And it went through some assorted owners uh, between 1858 and 1876, and there was a lot of changes of ownership. And even though sometimes the the mine wasn't being worked, there were miners who had various property interests interests on the claims, such as there were two arastas on the property. There were some ditches previous miners had dug. There was a water wheel on it at that time. And needless to say, a lot of those rights, they were preserved. But on February 9th, 1876, uh, there were two men by the name of George Green and Dan Devilbiss, and they decided that they wanted ownership of the sugar pine, and they adhered to the mining law, and they did what they were required to do. They went up there, and they discovered minerals, and they basically staked and recorded their claim. So they recorded that uh, 76. And they also arranged with the previous, you know, with some previous owners as far as those ditches and things of that nature, which were property or obtained them. So that is, this mine has been active and has maintained a current chain of title mm -hmm. since those two individuals, February 9th, 1876, uh, Dan Devilbiss, who was a co-locator on that claim, he actually sold out to uh, George well, Green's brother. Uh, let's Dan. go back. Let's go back. I understand this. Had, had a long chain of commandment. Let's go back to what just happened in March with the cease and desist order from the BLM. Tell us about what the BLM is saying, or can you? I, I've seen from your press releases you're saying that you can't get any specific information from them as to what the legal basis is for them to say that the uh, sugar pine mine needs to cease and desist operation. Well, it, it's both. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what actually started this is the owners have been actively uh, have been under current ownership for three years. They've owned the mine for three years from the previous owner. You know, and we have a complete chain of title all the way back. And they, they've spent a, a lot of money, and I when we've all spent a lot of time doing research to establish that. And BLM does not dispute that the the chain of title is that long. That that's one thing to point out. Even okay. they don't dispute that. And basically what happened was is uh, off and on, George Backus, who was one of the co-owners, he actually had fairly regular contact with BLM since he became the owner. And even even before, because there's quite a bit to the situation, and needless to say, he was in contact with them. And he had even spoken to employees such as Diane Perry at Medford BLM, which is our local BLM district here. And she was quite well aware that he was there and what his intentions were and that basically, you know, George's background, he has a lot of uh, heavy equipment operation background as far as road building. That's what George used to do was he used to build logging roads until the timber industry was destroyed here. So needless to say, they were very well aware of that. What kind of sparked this, even though George had actually maintained 
pretty routine contact with with the local BLM people, and I've you know spoken in the past to local archaeologists and stuff, and they were they were certainly aware of of Georgia's ownership, and you know I think they kind of had a basic idea of. Yeah, give us an idea because we're gonna gonna run out of time shortly here. Um, Kirby, yeah. give us an idea of what the BLM is saying. Certainly, they recognize that this is a very long chain of title. What are they complaining about here? Uh, basically, what happened is they actually there were two of their employees came out to the area and they actually ran into the mine caretaker, but opposed to going to his his front door and knocking on the front door and saying, hey, we're, we're BLM guys, we're here, we have to do some work in the area. They basically disregarded that, and they started poking around the camp and didn't identify themselves when they left. And the caretaker called the owners, and he says, hey, I have these people, they're, they're trespassers, what do you want me to do? And the owner said, please stop them, find out who these people are, because we have a, our economy locally is devastated, we have a lot of problems with thievery and vandalism and sure. things like mm -hmm. that. And he said, hey, the owners were very concerned, and he said, please find out who these guys are, I'm on the way. So basically they challenged yeah. their authority and that made them mad? Is that what you believe uh, uh, that's, instigated that's all this? That's pretty much what it is, mm -hmm. is, is basically as, as these two guys were coming out, they were on quads behind two locked gates, and the caretaker took his truck, he blocked the road, and he stepped out in front of the truck, and he had a pistol at his side in his hand. He didn't have a holster, but he just held his pistol at his side, and he waited for him, and they rolled up, and he said, I'm the caretaker here. I need to know who you are and what you're doing. You're running around the camp taking photos. And they said, we're, we're BLM employees. And he says, okay, I would like you to identify yourself. I want some identification. And they said, well, we don't have to do that. And he said, no, you, you really do. <laughs> he says, you know, do, tell me who you are. So, so they showed their cards, and they did identify themselves as two BLM archaeologists. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, that's fine. He said, you guys have a job to do. You guys can, you know, pretty much do as you, as you need. But he said, in the future, he says, this is a pre-55 claim. He says, we do have surface rights. He says, in the future, please call the, the owner, or he says, come out here and knock on the door and just let me know you're out here so I know who you are. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you guys are out in the woods and, and you don't come back for a reason, that, you know, if you guys get in trouble, I could help you guys out. So then you and start getting of, unexplained uh, bureaucratic uh, charges uh, brought against you yeah, after and, that. And kind of what happened was, and instead of these guys saying, hey, that's very reasonable, they went back and they actually filed a complaint about <laughs> the caretaker, and they basically said he threatened them. Mm -hmm. Which he did. He did not. He is. He has signed an affidavit of record that he did not do that. Uh, they basically sick the BLM special agent on him, and he is a, a very young guy, very hardworking. He's in his twenties. Um, he he actually took over as caretaker because he had some equipment at his mine actually stolen, and he kind of really didn't have a lot to do. So that's why he got together with George and Rick, and they, I they brought him in there. Let's let's and, uh, and let's talk about where. It, we're almost out of time. Hang on, Kirby. We're almost out of time. Let's get to where we are currently at this point. They've hired a legal counsel who has tried to ask the BLM why they're getting a cease and desist order. And, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the BLM gave them a deadline of the 25th, which is a week from Saturday, to uh, get out or they and to basically destroy, remove all equipment, uh, destroy all buildings, and fill in the mine tunnels. Uh, so tell us exactly where this is at the moment. So, so, that, so that's exactly what happened. There was a lot of going back and forth, us requesting information, them not supplying it, Freedom of Information Act requests being ignored. So then they send this notice of noncompliance saying, you guys need to stop. We're going to do this if you don't. And so the owners, they consulted with an attorney. So that is where that situation is. And in the meantime, despite that, BLM continue to keep coming out there. They're basically sending law enforcement guys out they're harassing the caretaker, you know, they're calling him constantly saying, we want a meeting, we want a meeting. And he says, I don't have to meet with you. I did nothing wrong. And I have a, I have a right to, you know, not speak to you in this country. And kind of where it went from there is one day, George and the caretaker were on the, the mine and there were two BLM law enforcement guys turned up. And one of them was a county deputy by the name of Jason Stanton. And he's actually, a, he's a deputy. You know, and we had actually, uh, we've had meetings with the county sheriffs here. We've had a very good relationship with him. And he came out and he says, uh, you know, you guys got a, a stop order. He says, uh, I'm here to give you another one. You know, I knew, I do know that uh, the owners, they really believe that they were <clears throat> there to engage in some nefarious activities, see if they were gone and basically either seize property or burn property. 
And George, the owner, he tells the deputy, he says, that's fine if you want to give me a piece of paper. And he tells the deputy, he says, I want you to realize, he says, I'm doing my best here to follow the law as I know it. And he says, you know, we really believe in the Constitution. And he says, we're really, we've really done and went out of our way to work with you and try to get information. And the deputy says, I have a very large problem with the Constitution. I have, I have a big problem with that idea. Oh, really? The deputy said that. Now, you got a new yeah. sheriff in town, right? You used to have a uh, Sheriff Gilbertson. I remember he, was, uh, he wrote a very long uh, article about how the federal government was infringing on people's rights and how it was yes, the duty of the uh, sheriff to stand there and, and, uh, and, and protect the people locally. But there was an election last November, and there's a new sheriff in town, right? Yes, yes, that's true. And, uh, you know, and as you said, Gil Gilbertson, he was a, a very big supporter of the mining community. He still is. He, he, he is quite aware of the situation. He has been doing what he can to help the, the owners. So we do have a new sheriff, and, and we had actually met with him kind of before this all came to a head. He did come to one of our meetings, and he said, you know, when he admits, he says, I really don't know a lot about this. He says, I don't know where I stand. He says, you know, I would like to get educated. And we said, that, that's great. You know, we're looking forward to, you know, more discussions. And then this kind of happened where, you know, he's in the middle of it. And my understanding is, is that he is actually doing his best to, to mediate this. And he has come out open publicly and said, you know, he has said similar, very similar to Gil Gilbertson, that I will not tolerate people violating the rights and property of the local citizens that basically I am in, obligated to defend. So we're, we're very happy about that. So right but now you're in a that. position, let, let's kind of sum up where you are right now. Uh, from what we've right. seen from Oath Keepers, who were in charge right. of uh, security for the area, they are in a security position right now. There's, this is not a standoff. Uh, the BLM right. has given a deadline, but so far there's been no moves towards that. Uh, the uh, Oath Keepers are asking for people who can come and help to provide security uh, to come to the area. But other than that, there is no uh, kind of a conflict there. And I think it's a very calming thing to have people there to provide security. That, I think prevents something like uh, uh, violence happening when there is uh, when there are people on both sides of the issue. But let's look at the bigger picture for just a moment because we're just about out of time, Kirby. Yeah. I, when I was looking at this, I went back into uh, some of the archives of the area to see what was going on. I got some reports from the early 90s about how, this 20 years ago, how the BLM was really cracking down on existing mines. And I think it's important for people who are listening to this, a lot of people think of uh, miners, they have a very negative view of them. They think they've, they've seen some of the destructive practices of open pit mining. Uh, that's not what's going on here. This is very small miners who have been working this in a more of a traditional uh, type of uh, posture. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that's correct. They're actually working the property in a similar way to the, it would have been worked in, say, the 30s. You know, they have a, mm -hmm. a small excavator to clean tunnels. They have a cabin. They have a very small mill. They can basically go in, extract rock, dig it up off the ground with a shovel, put it in an ore car, run it out there, and run it down to their mill and do things like that. And they have some larger equipment to maintain roads and obviously deal with, you know, large quantities of rock that may be left in piles that need moved. Okay, so things, so things really haven't changed from the articles that I was looking at 20 years ago. But I thought it was right. interesting to see this LA Times article from 1994. They talked to a guy, his name was uh, Jeff Garcia, or Jeff Garcia, and uh, he was a uh, geologist from Berkeley, and he talked about how he had worked a mine there at that time in 1994. He had worked it for 16 years, and basically they were making it impossible for him to continue operation. He had to pay a $300 permit because water was falling on his land and might cause runoff into the, uh, into the river, which, of course, other, uh, other operations, uh, farmers don't have to do that and shouldn't have to do that. And yet they give exemptions to large municipal areas. But I thought it was very interesting that they hit him with very stiff fines just because he had some sediment runoff. This was not the kind of heap leaching that some environmentalists have complained about that's been banned in some countries where they basically create a large open pit. They uh, excavate everything. They pulverize everything and then pour cyanide over it. This is nothing at all like this. This is, as you pointed out, traditional mining done by uh, small operators. This guy uh, spent half of his year in Alaska, half of it in Oregon with his wife, who is also a geologist. He had a lot of respect for the land, and he said this, Kirby. He said, society seems to have this guilt about disturbing the land. They still go to their big parking lots and their supermarkets, 
But if they have a chance to get rid of their guilt and nail some little miner on the hill, they feel like they've done their part to save the world. I think people need to see this in the proper context. They need to understand that this is part of the government's operations to shut down everybody's business, whether you are a small-time miner or whether you're a small-time retailer or a small-time manufacturer. They want to get the people out of it. But there's something else on these lands where people have had mineral rights or grazing rights or lumber rights. There's another aspect to this, and I think we can see it in what's going on in Arizona, where Senator John McCain just ran through in the National Defense Authorization Act uh, a process that is going to turn over an area that has recreational significance, it has historical significance to the Indians, and it has religious significance to the Indians who are there. And it was also protected in 1955, the same year that uh, right. your stuff got grandfathered in. What they're going to do is by turning it over to this foreign corporation, they're totally going to obliterate the area. This is not something where they're going in and just mining some minerals from underneath the surface. They're going to create a crater that can be seen from space. And this is what I think is going to happen. I want to get your opinion on this. This is what I think the end game is in all of these struggles running the people off the land. Because when we were at the Bundy Ranch, he was the last rancher still in business. They had run everybody else out of business with phony endangered species claims. And, of course, the desert tortoise that they were supposed to be protecting. They had rounded these things up, euthanized over a 1,000 of them because they said they didn't have the money to feed them. Yet they were financing an army to come against the Bundy family and to come against people who would uh, be on the land without their specific permission, attacking and assaulting people who were doing it. So when people go onto the BLM's land, they felt they had a right to assault and attack people, and yet when the BLM goes onto a gated property there in the Galice Mining District, uh, they get very upset if they're even asked to provide identification. Uh, I, I, I do want to clarify something there. It, it's actually not BLM's land. This is yes, exactly. Land that, yeah, this is actually land that is it is administrated and managed by the United States government for yes. the benefit of the American people. I misspoke. Um, yes, that's a very good under, point. It's under, not their under, land. Under the under the Constitution, the federal government is very limited in what it can own. And basically, this is where the mining law came in and the Homestead Act came in, is that basically the government was required under the law to dispose of this land. And basically what that means is pass into, into private ownership and basically allow the average person to benefit from it and basically make a living and make some sort of life for himself from it, and in turn, do something for the country. It, it's funny you mentioned Jeff Garcia. Jeff, Gar Jeff is actually a, a pretty good friend of ours. He is still there in Galice. He's still going strong. But you're right. He, he, it is exactly as he said. Uh, you know, I remember a comment he made to me one time. He said, when you're in court with these people, he said, you realize you're the only one sitting there not getting paid that day. <laughs> yeah, and, that's right. They starve you out. He, Thank you for he's correcting very, me. That very right about that. Yeah, he's very, very right about that. And I am aware of the situation down there in Arizona, in Arizona with the Apache land, and that is not something that we support. I mean, obviously, we do support mining, and we recognize that you know we need the minerals, and our society we we do utilize a lot of minerals. Almost everything we use is a mineral. You know, it derives from it. You know, basically, you know, we all, we're all there. You know, we all always say, if it can't be grown, it must be mined. So we do need the minerals, but at the same time, most no, of us yeah. who are in the mining community. But the, but really, the, I think the issue, uh, yeah. uh, Kirby, is that they want to take it away from the small people who live in the community. They want to take the uh, land oh. away from the people who would manage it locally. And of course, that's the big issue oh. out west as to right. who the land belongs to, who it should be, who the public lands right. should be managed by. And everybody is starting to wake up, I think, out west and say, these are public lands. They don't need to be managed by the federal government because they're doing a very poor job of it. And they are trying to expunge all of the individuals out of the area in an Agenda 21 kind of way so they can turn this over to large corporations who will obliterate it for all uses that everybody has, completely destroy the area rather than use it responsibly. And I think if we want to have responsible use of the land, it is best done at the local level. So I think that's a, a very big movement. When I said the BLM land, of course, that's the way the BLM is acting, as if it was their private property. Right. And we need to understand that it isn't. And as you point out, there's constitutional cases to be made that uh, the government uh, doesn't have the right to keep this much land. And we all know that from a practical standpoint, it shouldn't be done in that way. Well, we're going to continue to follow this. We're out of time. We've, uh, we've gone quite a long ways on this uh, interview. But 
Uh, we'll be in touch with you to see what happens. And of course, if anybody wants to support this operation, we will put the information on the uh, video as to where they can uh, make donations to uh, the Oath Keepers who are providing security or to the miners who have a large uh, legal fight ahead of them. The Galice Mining District has a legal fight that they're asking for donations to establish their rights. We need to understand that if you don't have uh, property rights are recognized by the government, if they can take them from one person, if they can take them from the miners, or they can take them from the ranchers, they can take them from you, even if you just have a suburban home. So we need to all understand that this affects all of us. Any last comments, uh, Kirby? Uh, that's, that's absolutely correct. And uh, as, as we say, as we miners say here locally, if you don't know about property, you probably are property. That's right. You know, or you're going That's to right. lose it. So, tell, us, uh, tell us how they can uh, support your, uh, where they can go to get information and to make a donation. Uh, if people want to get information as far as what's going on at the mine and how they can help, they should go to Oath Keepers, J-O-C-O, -O, that's JOCO. Mm -hmm. Oathkeepersjoco.com, and that is Josephine County Oath Keepers. They are the on the ground guys. You know they do have needs. If people want to support them with with food and things of that nature, please go there. Get in touch with their people. If you want to support the mine owners, please go to sugarpinemine.com, and that is the official website. You can also go to galicemining.com. That is our district site. Either one of those sites, we have a lot of information. If you go to sugarpinemine.com, you can send the miners a donation either by check directly to the owners or you can contribute through PayPal through okay. there. All right, great. And uh, uh, the, the thing I really want to reiterate is uh, that, you know, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm very close to the two owners of this mine, and they're not the only miners in this area under attack. There's actually several others that they're having problems. They're not to this level, but these are the two guys who've stood up. I was actually on the mine uh, yesterday with one of the owners. who's a good friend of mine, and we were standing there. There's a very old stamp mill on the mine that's been there for many years, and they have a title to it. And we were looking at that, and uh, he said, you know, he says, as long as I'm alive, he says, that is always going to be there. You know, well, I hope, it, many, many I hope it is. I hope that uh, they will respect your property rights. I hope you prevail in court. I hope this goes through peacefully, but we'll keep an eye on this. And we'll be having uh, an interview with the Oath Keepers. We are trying to establish contact with a couple of individuals there that we'll have on for interviews in the next couple of days. Thank you so much for joining us. Kirby Jackson with the Galice Mining District. And, of course, what they're trying to do is get a legal hearing to go through the legal process to stop the BLM from acting precipitously by giving them a deadline before they've given them answers, before they've had their hearing, before they have taken this through the court. And that's the important function that's being done now by the Oath Keepers, essentially setting up security to let them know that there's somebody there in case they're going to uh, try to storm the area. Hopefully that will stop that from happening so this can take its way all the way through the court. Well, that's it for our news tonight. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel there. If you're not a Prison Planet TV subscriber, please subscribe and support our operation financially. You can share this with up to 20 people at the same time and have access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries. Again, we'll be back tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com oil of oregano formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market, sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules you will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue wild crafted from the mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire this winter season it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano now available in our limited first run at infowarslife.com that's infowarslife.com or call 888-253-3139 you are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.